Welcome back, guys, to the football room. This week, James and I are talking about prospects in this class that we are sleeping on. We just do not see it with these guys. Um, make sure you guys are subscribed to our YouTube channel at A to Z Sports Film Room. Make sure you guys are following us on Instagram at A to Z Sports Film Room. And make sure you guys are following us on Twitter at A to Z Sports NFL. The football room is now open. Welcome everybody, the football room is now open. My name is Destin Adams, I am a Colts beat reporter for A to Z Sports and an NFL draft analyst, and I'm joined as always by Mr. X's and O's himself, the man you guys come to this channel for for content all week long, James Foster. James, man, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. Uh, excited to be a little bit of a hater this episode. The key is, the key is you just have to like couch every negative comment with some sort of out so that it, it can't come to bite you in the future. Got to say like, you know, landing spot will be key for him. Mm -hmm. And then hey, if they end up being an all pro, it's like, well, I didn't know they were going to the Raiders scheme. Like I, yeah, I, I would have, I would have had a 10th overall. Yeah. Cause if you would have told me he was landing to that one team, all pro no, without a doubt, but every other team, but like James said, we're going to get a little negative this week um, where we're going to be talking. If you watched last week, we got to jump into some of the sleepers in this class that we feel like people just aren't given enough love. And we decided to flip it to the other side of the coin this week. And we're going to be looking at players that we, we feel like are getting a little bit too much love for where we have them evaluated as players. Um, we are each going to go through a few different ones that we have, and we're going to give our thoughts on those players. I already know that uh, James is going to disagree with one of mine, for example. So excited to kind of hear where we all land on that. I'm going to let James start first. So James, who is the first player that you are? asleep on yeah man this is a player that really impressed me at the senior bowl and um at a certain time in the draft process like with a lot of these guys you know i think i would have uh probably called him a sleeper at one point but andrew phillips cornerback out of kentucky i feel like is being a little bit overrated uh at this point you know consensus top 100 type of player uh, a lot of people have him as a potential second round pick and for me there are just so many red flags on his tape and relatively few things positively that i think he brings to the table so starting with the positive he's incredibly explosive you see that with his athletic testing his vertical and broad jump were both above 96 percentile and you see that when he's like breaking on a flat route from zone coverage he gets there in a blink of an eye uh, you know goes zero to one zero to 100 real quick um i think really outside of that i i struggle to project andrew phillips as a high quality starter he's one of the worst tacklers in this class, 15 missed tackles this past season. Um, just, you know, the lack of size and length really uh, hurts him in that area like it does with a lot of defensive backs, but he makes that worse by just taking reckless angles to the ball, uh, not being a secure wrap-up tackler. In coverage, you know, I think he has adequate speed, but he really makes things harder for himself by staring into the backfield, losing track of deep coverage assignments. He will bite on pretty much anything. I mean, you can watch uh, Xavier, one of Xavier Leggett's touchdowns uh, from their matchup this past season, beat him on a double move. He lost several times to double moves uh, on tape this past season. And, you know, I think, as far as man to man coverage, you know, like you want a smaller player uh, like Andrew Phillips, who's 5'10, 190 pounds. You want him to be really sticky in man coverage, uh, staying tight to the hip pocket. And he's just very loose. I don't really think he has great uh, route anticipation, break recognition in single coverage. And, you know, I question some of the hip fluidity and uh, just, you know, from an athletic standpoint, the mirror skills. And that's why he's incredibly grabby in coverage, had five penalties this past season, 
uh, very undisciplined with his hips. And then he gets bodied at the catch point and jump ball situations. You can go over the top of Andrew Phillips. So for a player with, with all of those areas that they struggle, that has zero career interceptions, that you're projecting to move into the slot, but he's almost guaranteed to be a net negative in the run game. I, I have an early fifth round grade on him. That's uh, you know very different from the consensus. Um, but yeah, he, he's a player that that I just don't see it on. Did think he had a very good senior bowl, um, and so that that definitely raised his stock in my eyes. But uh, still a still a firm day three type of player for me. Yeah, I mean, like you said, Phillips had a strong week at the senior bowl. Um, I, I think. The guys that are going to do well in those practice setups are usually the physical type corners like him. Um, he's aggressive. He's physical with his hands. He, he's, he's not scared to put his hands on a receiver. Um, I, I didn't think I was lower on him than the consensus until, like you said, this last month, he seems to be this top 100 guy wow. for a lot of people. Um, he came in at 151 on my big board. So, like, I didn't think that was crazy until this last month happened. Um, I, I think he's a guy that you can draft early day three. I, I think if a team took him in the fourth round, I wouldn't blink an eye at it. Um, he ended up getting a late fourth, early fifth grade for me. Um, I, I think if a team took him in that early mid fourth to throw into the slot and play special teams, I can see it. Um, the, the people that are saying second and third round shocks me just because like, I have a hard time seeing Phillips slide to the outside to play corner at the next level. Um, I think he's going to be a guy that pretty much has to play in the slot. Um, only a certain amount of guys to me can go in the first two days of the draft. If you're just penciling in and they have to play in the slot. Um, I think he has special teams ability, but again, I'm not going to take a guy or very many guys in those first two days of the draft that I think have to play in the slot. And there's other guys, there's other slots in this class that are just better. <laughs> They're just better corners. Um, so I think that hurts him a little bit as well. Um, but if a slot needy team needs him in that early to mid fourth, I would be okay with it. I, I wouldn't be drafting him in the second or third round. I, I think any team that does that's reaching, but um, I, I saw Dane Brugler of the athletic came out today saying he, he doesn't think he's getting out of the second round. So uh, wh whoever that team is, we'll, we'll, we'll see who that is, but I, I can't imagine I'm going to give that one a good grade. Yeah. If you're, if you're, like a almost guarantee to move into the slot. Um, I think that I think nickel is, you know, probably not equally as important as outside corner, but you know, in today's NFL, it's, it's up there in positional value. It's not like a throwaway position like it used to be. Yeah. But if you have um, ostensibly like size uh, or maybe speed limitations that are, is forcing a move into the slot, the rest of your profile needs to be pretty clean for me to want to take you uh, in the first two rounds, especially. And yeah, I, I just don't, I don't see that with Andrew Phillips, like a lot to like, but uh, just so many red flags and potential weaknesses. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and go over to my um, first guy that I'm sleeping on. And this isn't a guy that I have a low grade on by any means. It's just in this there's in this offensive tackle class, there's so many talented players that I don't understand how this guy is getting looked at in the top seven at least. Um, and there are people that have him in their top five, and that's Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma. Um, this guy is projected to go in the mid to late first round. Um, I think – in a class that just has so many guys that I think are going to be able to play at a high level day one. Like I think Tyler Guyton is going to have a lot of learning curves at the next level. Um, I understand the upside with him and I, I don't think that is a thing to, that should deter teams because he is this guy that I think is, has a lower floor than a lot of these tackles. But like the problem is like, I think a lot of these guys that can play day one have high ceilings still like, like Tyler Guyton to me just falls in a class that just has a lot of talented players at tackle. And that's what's hurting him on my board more than him as a player himself. But if he is going to get drafted as a top seven tackle, for example, like that's just going to be wild to me. Um, I, I think it was Matt Miller of ESPN today put out that he, he thinks Tyler Guyton's going to get drafted before Marius Mims out of Georgia. And I, I just don't see it. 
I, I really don't on tape. I don't see it. Um, to me, I, I think Mims is just the better prospect, the better player, offers you the upside, offers you the higher floor. Like, I, I don't see an argument to take Guyton over Mims, for example. Now, are there some tackles in this class that are some tweeners that we've talked about in previous episodes? Hint, hint, check out the old episodes. Um, but um, are there some guys like that that maybe you could make the argument of taking Guyton over? I, I get it. But to me, there's no chance that I'm taking him as a top seven tackle. Um, we'll, we'll see kind of where the board falls. But, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest. He, he came in as my tackle 11 um, on my board, which I know I'm lower on him than most. Um, but that top seven range, I think, is a threshold that I just can't even get behind. That that eight to ten range, I can understand arguments for. But that, that top seven range, I just don't see it. Yeah, I'm pretty much with you. I mean – Let's see, I'm counting here. So I would have him, if we're going by, based on consensus, like positional alignment, I would have him as tackle seven. Um, since I'm I'm kind of... Uh, say how, many, how many guys... With, with moving the tackles inside on my say, board. That, that doesn't you know, count Fuwaga for you. Uh, that doesn't count Fuwaga. And at guard. So he is my tackle five technically. But yeah, with Tyler Guyton, like you kind of just have to reckon with the fact that his tape is not good. Um, and you're really, you're really just betting on the upside. Like the way that the way that he looks with just the long arms, densely packed frame, the way that he can glide around the pocket um, in terms of foot speed and, you know, just being light on his feet at that size. Like, I think he's, he's up there with, Olu Fashanu, um, Olu Fashanu in this class, but then everything from the legs up is just, it's not really there at this point with Tyler Guyton. He doesn't know what he's doing with his hands. Um, even though he has really good natural play strength, like he can, he can resist a bull rush, but there's a lot of times that he'll just catch it. And when you project to that being an NFL power rusher, uh, you can definitely see him getting walked back into the pocket some, uh, he doesn't really recognize, you know, inside movement stunts. I felt like most of his losses on tape were just him letting people into the, you know, letting people into the pocket, not necessarily him getting beat. Um, and then I, I, you know, I wasn't a fan of his run blocking tape either. So yeah, I've, I've got him right outside of the first round. He's, he's 33 on my board and he's a player that can kind of go up and down, up or down, like four to five spots whenever I update my grades, just based on how willing I am to take a risk um, on that day. Um, but yeah, all of your concerns with Tyler Guyton, I I'm pretty much uh, in lockstep with. Um, so my next guy that I don't see it on is going to be edge rusher Adisa Isaac out of Penn State. Um, I think I, I think it was a mock draft video maybe there was one video I did where I, I made like the offhand comment that like, Oh, Adisa Isaac could be the best uh, Penn state edge rusher. And that was really based on me just being frustrated with chop Robinson's tape, uh, not really doing it for me. But like once I finished up all of Isaac's tape, I just see the path to him being a high quality starter as so narrow. Like, to me, his 90th percentile outcome is being a mid-range number two edge rusher that you're looking to upgrade because he doesn't give you much as a pass rusher. Like if if the argument for Adisa Isaac is we're going to draft him and he's just going to be a quality run defender that makes a couple tackles per game, doesn't really get moved back in the run game, but other than that, you don't hear from him much. Okay. I don't really see that as a top two rounds uh, type of prospect in terms of value because um, I, I just think the pass rushing upside is so low with Isaac. He's an average athlete, I think, in terms of you know explosiveness and, and lateral quickness, really struggles to bend around the corner. I don't see speed rushing being a major element of his game. Like I, I don't really think he's going to be someone that's threatening tackles to the outside um power rush is okay at the college level i don't think it's i don't think it's going to be super effective for him in the nfl at 247 pounds and 
in terms of what he does with his hands, like he doesn't really have any sort of refined pass rushing skill set at this point. So I don't see really the upside with Adisa Isaac as a pass rusher. And I think the run defense is, is good, but it's not like Will Anderson levels. You know, it's, it's just, he's a good college run defending edge. Um, to me, that's kind of a borderline top 100 type of pick. And I think top 50, top 60 uh, for Adisa Isaac is way too high. Yeah, I mean, I find myself pretty average on Isaac. I, I can't think of what the like consensus spot for him right now is. He's 66 on the consensus board. Yeah, so he, he came in at 63 for me. So, I mean, that's pretty much right right there. Um, he, he's a guy that I can see the upside with him. And, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I'm not a big fan of the day two edge rushers in this class in general. Um, to me, if I'm not taking one of the top three in the first round, I'd much rather take a shot on some of these guys in the fourth and fifth round. Um, and there are guys that people have as fourth and fifth rounders that I had grade higher than a guy like Isaac, who's one of these day two edge rushers that a lot of people have. Um, I, I, the production stuff isn't there yet with Isaac, obviously. Um, I like his length. Um, I like his bend. I like his speed. Um, I think he really needs to be in a place where he can be a stand-up rusher um, more so than his his hand in the ground. Um, I, I, I think there are minimal spots that I would take him on day two. And because of that, like I see where you're coming from. But as a player, I think edge rusher is one of the ones more so that teams – will draft one to two rounds higher than what their tape says they are because of what they can be. Um, so like him going in the third round won't shock me. If a team takes him in the second, I'm going to consider that a reach. Um, but there are people that think that's an option for him, but as a whole, and just as a rule of thumb, this, this cycle, I'm, I'm pretty out on taking an edge rusher on day two altogether. Um, but that, that's kind of like where I stand with Isaac. Yeah, I see the I see the second tier of edge rushers kind of maybe the third tier, like after the top five, I guess I see is just such a big clump where if I'm looking to take a day two or early day three edge rusher, I would just say I'll let the other teams have their pick and then I'll take like the fifth or sixth guy from this tier because I, I like them all pretty uh, similarly. Hey, yeah, G- give me Muhammad Kamara in the fourth or fifth before I take any of those day two guys. Um, and, and I have him over a lot of these day two guys, but we'll, we'll get into that another, another episode. Um, the next guy that I just don't really see it on. This is another guy that I, I didn't come in super low on. It's just people saying he could be the first corner taken on day two um, is a little bit rich for me. Um, and that's Georgia corner Kamari Lassiter. Um, I think I said his last name, right? I, if you guys know me at all, I butcher last names. It's a, it's a talent of mine. Um, but Kamari Lassiter, um, out of Georgia, um, at the combine measured in at just over 5'11, 186 pounds. Um, to me with Lassiter, like I see the fact that he's solid at so many things. It's just, he doesn't have any element of his game to me that like, grabs you when you watch him on tape and in a corner class that I really like he just falls behind a lot of people um I'd have to pull up my board to make sure where he came in at at corner but there's so many talented guys in this class that me seeing him mocked in that 33 to like 42 range is crazy to me um like I I just do not see a guy on tape that I'm taking that high especially when if you're drafting a guy that early in the second round the expectation is going to be that they play right away very few and it's very positional based but very few corners are going to get drafted in the top 50 picks and don't start day one if they're healthy like that that, that's a pretty rarity thing that we see um but Lassiter came in as my corner 12 in this class. Um, I would be much more comfortable taking him in the, I mean, I want to say third round, but like personally I I wouldn't take him until the fourth just because I don't see a guy that I would come in and play right away. I think even in the third round at corner, you're, you're going to have somebody that you want to at least draft with the thought process that he's playing right away. Um, I think 
Lasseter has the ability to play on the outside and the inside, which helps him. Uh, we talked about that earlier with Andre, with with Phillips that I, I viewed him as a guy that could only play in the slot. I, I think Lasseter can play in both, and I think if he's going to a team that plays heavy zone – then he's going to be higher on their boards than a team that plays a lot of man. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of let it all fall out. But uh, there's no chance that if I was in charge of a team that I'd be taking Lasseter in the second round. There's just there's just no shot. So you think you think Lasseter could play on the outside at like with four six speed? I, I think he could play on the outside. It just depends. Like again, like he has to go to a heavy. Like I think his per, his understanding of his own coverages are going to help him. And that's why, again, he has to go to a place that's zone, especially if you're going to play him on the outside. I think he's best suited in the slot, but I think he's a guy that can be a depth outside corner. I don't think he could be a starting level outside corner, but I think having a guy that can be, can fill in in a pinch like that. Like I I think he could play snaps on the outside of the NFL. I do. So it's interesting, like looking at the kind of consensus, second tier of corners you know after you get past the top five with Quinion Mitchell Terry and Arnold Nate Wiggins Kool-Aid McKinstry Cooper DeGene that next group had really bad um I guess you know combine and pro day circuits like Kamari Lasseter runs a there's a ton of different reports with with pro day times but like 464 is seems to be the consensus um, you know, you got Ennis Rakestraw running four five one, which isn't as bad. You got TJ Tampa with a, a four five eight. Like a lot of these guys, I, I like um, so many elements of, of all of their tape, but the track record really just speaks for itself with corners and forty times. And it's like. I hate to be someone that just looks at looks at a number and then move someone down my board. And I didn't move them down, you know, a, a ton, but you do kind of have to be a stickler with those things. Um, when it comes to Lassiter, I think, you know, the the one thing that I would that I think sticks out is like his trump card trait on tape is his physicality, which for a corner, I don't really want that to be your one best trait like i'd rather it be something physical you know like speed or fluidity or something but he is extremely physical just um you know patrols the flats whether it's screens checkdowns in zone coverage um really aggressive at the line of scrimmage and i think that you know he ran the bad 40 time but the recovery speed is i think a clear issue on tape for him um so yeah you said like 33 to 42 range is ridiculous. I've got him at 41, so just barely ridiculous. Um, I do think I do st- still think that like late second uh, to you know anywhere in the third, um, I'm good with for Lassiter because I, I think he is someone that's just a really good football player. But there are just going to be certain matchups in the NFL that is an automatic mismatch, and you know you line up Kamari Lassiter against. When you know you can go down the list of of speedy NFL receivers, and the quarterback's going to be pointing that out as a mismatch. So, um, yeah, in terms of draft value, um, I, I think that there are real limitations with Kamari Lasseter. So, probably disagree with you that I, I think I like him a little bit better on tape than you do. But um, you said forty one. Yeah, you said forty ones where you have him. Yeah. Yeah, he, he came in at 81 on my board, so like a third-round pick, essentially. Um, so a 40-spot difference is pretty different, so we definitely see him differently. Yeah. But, hey, that, that, that's the draft. That is. Um, so we'll I'll stick with another cornerback um, for my uh, final don't-see-it guy. And I'm going to go all the way down my board to cornerback 25, which is Cam Hart out of Notre Dame. Um, this is a player like, you know, I, I follow a lot of Titans stuff as a Titans fan. And like before, uh, the Titans traded for, uh, Legereus Sneed, Cam Hart was a really popular second or third round mock pick. And I was always just so confused what people saw in Cam Hart. Um, he's six, three, 202 pounds, really long arms. That's all great. But you turn on his tape he cannot run down the field with receivers. Like if you were to just 
uh, pull together all of the times that he faced a vertical route with the receiver running full speed, I would say he lost over half of them. He's habitually grabbing at the Jersey. Anytime he has to turn and run like that automatically, that puts you in the tier of like, you have to be in a zone scheme, which is a really easy thing to say in the draft, but there's not a lot of true zone, like just exclusive zone schemes, even the Colts who are, you know, heavy cover three, like they will still run some man, like 15 to 20% of the time. And even in cover three, you have to be able, you have to be fast enough to run down the sideline with a receiver. If they run a go route, like you can't, you can't just be getting stacked by five yards, uh, you know, anytime they outside release. Um, and then on top of that with cam Hart, he, is really stiff moving laterally. So I I don't think there's really any mirror man coverage potential with him. Um, When he does get to press in Notre Dame's scheme, he is really disruptive at the line of scrimmage. So um, I could see a role, a, a specific role in the NFL where he's just like playing press cover two. He's got a lot of safety help. Um, Maybe as like, some sort of big slot type of player, although he's not shifty enough for that. I don't know, man. I, he, to me, he's like if Juju Brents was also not fluid. You know, it's like I, 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 just, I don't really see, I don't really see what the upside with Cam Hart is outside of zone coverage instincts. Um, does some nice stuff there, and he's got the size. I, I just don't think he's athletic enough uh, to play man coverage in the NFL, which even in zone schemes. It, every every coverage turns to man at some point and i think he's going to really struggle yeah i mean cam hart another guy at the senior bowl had a really strong week um if you ask me after quinion mitchell which corner was the most impressive during one-on-ones during the week it'd probably be cam hart um and i was shocked to see it um just because I didn't see that on tape right um I, i think he was a guy that his traits are something that are more attractive than watching him at Notre Dame. Um, So when he he ends up being a little bit higher um, on my board than yours, um, probably significantly, actually, Um, he ended up coming in at 69 overall. So he's a top 100 player for me. Um, He's a a guy that I would take in the top in the third round um, just because of length, size combined with his athletic profile. Um, I I think he's a guy that with the right coaching can be unlocked a lot. Um, And the size element's big. Um, Being a guy that measured in at 6'3", 202 at the combine, um, still ran a 4'5", which – I think he's plenty fast enough. Um, I, I think a lot of people get mesmerized by the the, the high four threes, low four fours. Um, that a four five is starting to look like a slow time in the NFL. Four four five is plenty fast enough for a guy like Cam Hart. Um, I, I think there, I've seen guys take him in like the second round in mock drafts. I don't see that at all, um, just because I, I think there's a lot of coaching that's going to have to be done uh, to for you to feel comfortable with him playing as an outside corner um, right now. I do – I will say that on like he, he's a really, really solid special teams player at Notre Dame, um, which helps his case a lot. Um, I, you usually aren't drafting and guys to, to throw on special teams in the third round, but if he were to fall into the fourth, like I think that makes him one of the more attractive corner options as well because he's just been a proven gunner already. Um, so just to be able to throw him out there like that. But um, Cam Hart is a favorite of Colts fans, so any Colts fans that are watching from, that, that also follow me are going to be really upset with you, James. But I, I can't understand it. I, I understand that. A lot of Cam Hart's um, evaluation is projecting what he can be compared to what he is right now, and that can be a scary game because when you start playing that, you get guys that are that are going to be in the UFL in three years. Yeah, I didn't know about the special teams, Um, so that yeah, I might I might bump him up like ten spots uh, for that, but yeah, he he's going to be he's going to be one of the guys that I'm I'm lowest on relative to consensus. feel pretty certain about that. Hey. Uh, who's your, do you have one more? Yeah. I so say the, the next guy that I'm going to go with here, um, I know you're not going to agree with, um, but it's quarterback Bo Nix out of Oregon. Um, for me, 
I just wouldn't take Bo Nix in the top three rounds. And I understand that's probably going to be where he goes. Um, for me, he, he's not a top five quarterback in this class. Um, I, I have that pretty handedly. Um, I, I don't see a lot of upside with Nix as a prospect. And at the quarterback position in today's NFL, like I understand the importance of high floors. I think Bo Nix is a, is a guy that I think is important to have is – a very high IQ quarterback to have as a backup role, for example, but I'm not taking that a, a non high upside quarterback for me in those top three rounds. Um, so he's a day three quarterback for me. But if I were to look at quarterbacks in this class that I wanted to draft to be that backup quarterback that has to play in the sense of an injury or something like that. Like I, I think Nick's would be my go-to pick for that range of things. Um, I, I just don't see a guy that's ever going to be a long-term starter in the NFL. Um, there, there's mock drafts that have him going 12 to Denver um, early in the second round. And I, I just can't get there. Um, and I understand the quarterback factor into this that, Quarterbacks are drafted multiple rounds higher than where they can come in at your boards at times, and I understand that. But like at the end of the day, like I, I just don't see the sense of taking a quarterback just to take a quarterback. And I think that's what a lot of these mock drafts have been, where if you're taking Bo Nix at 12, um, it, you looked at the team need at quarterback and said he's the, the best thing we got left. And I just don't think that's the best philosophy when looking at quarterbacks, um, especially quarterbacks and how important that position is. Um, Nix is a guy that on my board came in at quarterback seven um, after the first tier of guys, of course, and then Penix and Rattler I have above Nix. Um, so Nix at seven for me um, and then ended up – with a fifth round grade for Knicks, and he ended up at 110 on my big board. Um, I see the value in Knicks in the NFL, and I can see why he can have a long career. I just don't think it's going to be as a starting quarterback. Yeah, I mean, so I, I definitely disagree with that. I think um, looking at you know looking at your argument, I think there there are definitely elements of it that I agree with. Um, so I, I think the big thing that I would disagree with is, is the upside. Um, I think that that's probably the, the main thing that I feel like people are underselling with Bo Nix is that he does have a really good arm. He is really athletic. I would say almost like dead, even athleticism with uh, someone like JJ McCarthy, who's, who's being billed as this like loose dynamic athlete. Um, you know, you watch Bo Nix take it on a read option, jump cut in the open field. Like he's got some, some real NFL movement skills and he's well built. He's not tall. That's, that's probably one of his biggest knocks, but, uh, just in terms of, of build and makeup, like he has, he has the, the sturdiness that you look for to, to take hits. Um, my biggest thing with Bo Nix is that. I just think the footwork is such a mess and I don't know that I can, you know, he, he was pretty accurate last year, but I, I feel like his, his accuracy might, um, I, like, I, I'm not saying accurate from a completion percentage standpoint. I'm talking about, you know, throws down the field being on target. Like I felt like he was pretty accurate last year, but, um, I definitely think that could regress just based on how wonky his footwork gets at times, um, makes throws a lot more difficult than they need to be by not throwing from a consistent base. Um, but you know, I think that he is, he's his most likely outcome in my opinion is somewhere in that prime Derek Carr to like prime Andy Dalton tier of quarterbacks, which I, I definitely understand not feeling comfortable taking that in the first round. Um, I do think that uh, early second round, uh, if I needed a quarterback, he would be someone that I'm targeting. But from the standpoint of a GM that is usually going to get a shot at one quarterback in their tenure, do I want that one shot to be Bo Nix? Not necessarily. Like if, I, if I'm playing Madden and I've just got unlimited dart throws, um, and you know, he's, he's the best guy on my board at like pick 20 or 26 or something like that. Sure. I'll take Bo Nix, but 
If like this is gonna, if this is the guy that my job security is gonna be tied to, I might want to shoot for the fences a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, I definitely, I, I see the uh, the negative arguments for him, even though I'm definitely higher on him than consensus. I think the thing with Nix and McCarthy, because um, you mentioned the similarities as an athlete and how McCarthy's being billed compared to how Nix is being billed. Um, I, I think what plays into M- McCarthy's f- favor a bit is the fact that you can watch him at Michigan and it's just very clear of what he was not asked to do. So because you don't see him do it, because it's clear you can say that – what if he can, right? Like you can ask that question with, with Nick's being the long starter. He was, we got to see him at Auburn. We got to see him at Oregon. We got to see him do a little bit of different things in both places. Like, I I don't think there's much mystery with Bo Nix as a prospect in comparison to others, which isn't a bad thing. Um, It's just more so like, I feel like we know what you're getting in a Bo Nix, right? like compare in comparison to what McCarthy is being billed as and how he's kind of rose to this first rounder. And I well, mean, the eight, the age is a big thing. That also McCarthy being too. 20, yeah, being 20 compared to, I don't know when Nick's birthday is, but let's look. Uh, he's like 24. Yeah. He's, he's 24.1 years old right now. So yeah, there you go. So turn just turned 24 in February. Um, so that definitely plays into it as well. Um, now, I think the thing with Knicks that could be interesting, like a team like Denver, who is currently projected to start Jared Stidham uh, <laughs> right now, they don't have a third round pick. Um, so if they don't take Bo Nix early, like I, I think that's also what gets played into fact there and probably why you, I mean, they don't have a second round pick. Apologize. They have a third round pick. Like if they traded back from 12 to get a second round pick, right. like, that could become a little bit more of an option there. Um, yeah, I, I, I just have a hard time seeing it. And I, I have a hard time taking a guy like Nick's over Rattler or Penix even just because I, I think there's more to be desired as a starting level quarterback with those two guys and why he came a little bit lower. But Nick's and Rattler in the end of it, like I, I said earlier, Nick's came in at 110 on my board. Rattler came in at 108. Um, so they, they were very, very close in terms of I- – I can excuse having Penix over Nix. Rattler, Rattler was like my fourth, my fourth cut for for this list. Um, I feel like, I feel like there are too many people that are just watching the Georgia game and then like making some pretty bold uh, proclamations about Spencer Rattler. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I get it. I get it. He had a good week at the Senior Bowl too. Um, Rattler did, but we'll we'll yep. we'll, we'll, we'll see um, how these quarterbacks fall. Let us know in the comments. If you think we are sleeping on these guys um, and feel and give your guys' pitch on why those players didn't deserve to be in this episode, and if you have players that we didn't mention today, drop those in the comments as well. We'd love to see them. We'd love to interact with those. Um, that will be it for this week of The Football Room. We'll be back next week. And, again, we're getting closer and closer to the draft, people. April 25th is right around the corner. Uh, make sure you guys are subscribed to this channel for all of the content that James puts out throughout the week as well as the football room each week as we get you prepared for the draft and I can't wait to react to some of these picks. 